Okay. All right. So we're on, right? Yes. Okay. So, hi guys. Thanks for uh, thanks for stopping by. My name is Paul Kirby. Uh, I'm a staff uh, writer and reporter for the Daily Freeman, and I'm here with our senior uh, editor, Avon Lahara. And uh, we are featuring today yet another uh, debate in our series of debates that we've been doing virtually uh, for the past few weeks. Anyway, today uh, we have the candidates who are running for the 103rd uh, Assembly District, currently uh, a seat held by Kevin Cahill. Uh, but today we have uh, Sarah Hannah Shrestha. Uh, if she's uh, uh, running as a Democrat, and we have Republican Patrick Sheehan, uh, who uh, both are running uh, for the November 8th uh, election. Thanks, you guys, for coming by. Appreciate it very much. Uh, we're going to do uh, three minutes of opening statements, uh, and then we'll uh, continue to do to the questions. Um, so, some we composed ourselves and others uh, we uh, were sent in by uh, uh, some readers. Uh, so Patrick, uh, we're gonna go with you first in alphabetical order. Uh, and uh, then uh, Sarah Hannah will get to go first for the closing statements uh, in the end. Uh, so Patrick, go ahead, you got three minutes. All right, thank you. Thank you uh, to the Daily Freeman, Ivan, uh, Paul, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Patrick Sheehan. I am born and raised in Ruby, New York. My family moved to the town of Ulster in 1911. Um, my parents moved to Rhinebeck when I was a kid. My father was a New York State trooper. My mother was a Kingston school teacher. Uh, I went to Coleman High School. I took a year off after high school and uh, was a member, joined the Rhinecliffe Volunteer Fire Company. I have over 30 years of fire service. I was a line officer, a past president and an elected fire commissioner. I went to Boston College undergrad, graduated in 93, and uh, to Albany Law School. I worked uh, in the prosecution field for a few years and uh, have been in private business uh, since 2001, 2002. Uh, I am married. I have three children home. Uh, they attend Kingston School District. Uh, my oldest is in college. She's a sophomore at Catholic University. My wife and I take care of my mother-in-law, who is uh, in end-stage dementia, which is pretty tough. Uh, she lives with us. Uh, I do real estate. I've been in the real estate field for a few years now. Uh, I work on both sides of the river in Rhinebeck and here in Kingston, and I run a marina. So I'm a local guy. Uh, let me tell you why I got in this race. Uh, Kevin Cahill served 13 terms in the New York State Assembly. He kept going back to Albany because he did a good job. Uh, he did the job the constituents uh, hired him to do, voted him in to do. Uh, infrastructure has his fingerprints all over it. He, unfortunately, uh, in 2016, the Democrat Socialist of America started targeting soft Dems, as they called them, uh, long-standing Democrat uh, incumbents. And in 16, they started moving infrastructure into the Hudson Valley, into this district, manpower, uh, money, uh, in the guise of nobody leaves Kingston for the many, et cetera, to take out uh, incumbents. Uh, it's the AOC model. We saw it in the Joe Crowley race down in Queens. I observed it recently in the Dave Donaldson race that my opponent uh, ran the campaign on. And I knew that Kevin was in trouble. And I, I had been a Democrat from 20, 2001 until 2018. So I knew he was in trouble. And I knew that uh, this national agenda, this socialist agenda did not comport with my values and who I am and who I really feel this district needs to be represented by. And that's why I'm here and that's why I'm running. Okay. Sarah Hannah, go, you're up, three minutes. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sarah Hannah Shrestha. I am the Democratic nominee for State Assembly in District 103. Um, I am an immigrant from Kathmandu, Nepal. That's where I was born and raised. And I grew up in a lot of political uh, turmoil. Up until I was eight or nine years old, we did not have democracy. 
um, and I was witness to the uprising that happened, um, uh, you know, often violent, that got us the democracy where the centuries old monarchy stepped down and, and restored power to the people. Um, and since then, I have been a keen observer of um, basic rights, wealth inequality, people who get left behind, um, and it has always shaped who I am today. I came to the United States as a student in 2001, um, and I have been organizing uh, specifically on state level, but also sometimes federal level uh, campaigns that become uh, law. And, you know, I, one of the reasons I felt an urgency to run, um, I decided basically October, it was a last minute decision around October, 2021 uh, to run for this uh, office is because uh, we saw during the pandemic that um, a disruption such as the pandemic to our economy completely saw our safety net, our foundation crumble beneath people's feet. Um, I had been organizing on, um, you know, uh, under Governor Cuomo to create a uh, budget surplus, and we worked on a campaign with very minor tweaks uh, that created four point three billion dollars. Um, and I and we had a, you know, Democratic super majority. So I went in with a lot of hope that we can do something coming out of the pandemic that would address um, problems at their their root. And what I saw in the state assembly was a great opportunity to organize um, on some of the roadblocks that are still happening there. The state assembly has 150 members, which means there is a lot of organizing that you need to do persistent follow-up, building relationships with your colleagues to get a move on anything. Um, and I saw a potential and an optimism uh, for what we could do for uh, folks here in, in the New York state. Um, and I will say that, you know, a lot of it uh, is built upon things that people before me have done. We talk about quote unquote socialist agenda. What we are fighting for are the same things that FDR uh, wanted to do and talked about during the second world war, including um, his attempt to you know, prevent landlords from wrongfully evicting tenants, including price control on, on basic goods uh, during inflation. So there's a lot of work to be done and I'm happy to, hear, uh, be, to be here and, and get some questions that we can discuss in detail. Okay, great. Uh, so we're gonna start off with uh, a question that uh, we got from, uh, 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 that we composed ourselves, but we, we got a couple of uh, questions about it uh, from uh, readers as well. And we've heard this concern over and over again, and that is, people can no longer take their central Hudson bills. Uh, it is uh, uh, the company just last week or a couple of weeks ago announced uh, a new kilowatt price uh, supply cost for them. Uh, and it is quadrupled uh, in four months. Um, so we're gonna put this question to you guys to see if elected to the uh, if elected to the uh, state assembly, uh, what would you do to try to rein this in? Or, or is there anything that you can do? Uh, the other lawmakers that are currently in office have sent letter after letter after letter to the PSC and uh, Central Hudson themselves, uh, almost pleading uh, for them to uh, uh, stop uh, hiking their course. And yet uh, it continues. Uh, so if you get to this uh, state assembly, what are you guys going to do about this? Uh, uh, Shannon, Sarah Hannah, you can, uh, you can uh, go first. Sure. So the, the way I got into state organizing is actually through, um, you know, a campaign to bring energy democracy uh, to our system that is basically run by corporate monopolies throughout the country and as well as throughout the state. So I have actually been organizing um, on Central Hudson issues for at least two years. And the, the process that we have in place through the Public Service Commission to hold Central Hudson accountable and to protect people is inadequate. Year after year, we see that Central Hudson 
uh, comes up with a myriad of reasons to request rate hikes. Um, and in fact, we have what is called a perverse incentive for private corporations, whereby building in unnecessary infrastructure, uh, they get to ask for more money. And what usually ends up happening is that Central Hudson will ask for something. There will be um, a, a, you know, a process, rate case, and, and so on that we go through. But usually what happens is they end up getting a version of what they want. And, and this has been happening, you know, not just uh, now with the new billing issues, but this is generally the history of private uh, distribution utilities in this country. Um, so there are several things that we can do to address this question. I know that Senator Michelle Hinchy has a bill specifically targeted at um, uh, you know, uh, limiting estimated billing that's causing this issue that has not passed in the state assembly. It is once again, yet another example of one of the hundred things uh, that's stuck in the state assembly. So I would be able to rally around that bill in the assembly. Second, we do need to think about uh, capping the price for these utility bills and making sure that's coming out of the shareholders pocket and not taxpayers. There's also a community call to cancel the current utility debt and make the shareholders pay. I support that as well. But in the long term, we really need to ask the hard question, is Central Hudson the correct type of body to run our energy system in a complete monopoly? Okay, Patrick, go. All right, um, the Public Service Commissioner um, two years ago indicated that the climate leadership uh, CLCPA law that was passed in 2019 was essentially an unfunded mandate to power providers in this state. They are giving them until 2030 to meet unrealistic goals and are putting cost burdens on upgrading their infrastructure that have to be passed on to the rate payers. That's just how it works. Uh, we've seen this in Kingston with the water uh, supply. They are now paying to fix Cooper Dam. If you demand without any mechanism to fund as the state of New York did between the assembly and the Senate, that these climate goals be met, and you don't provide a mechanism, you are going to have this issue. And that is essentially what we have. My opponent wants public power, which is ownership by the state of private utilities. The cost to purchase the infrastructure from Niagara Mohawk, uh, Con Ed, Central Hudson would be absolutely astronomical. Uh, what can we do? We can work with the utilities. I, I agree that Central Hudson, especially under Ford's leadership, has been very negligent uh, towards the ratepayers, the people who are paying these bills. But how do we modify that? We, we have to go back and, and re, rework the Climate uh, Leadership uh, Act that is, that is really causing a tremendous burden at this time with the cost of fuel, that we are seeing across the country. Okay, Patrick, thanks. Uh, <coughs> so, Hannah, you have, a, yeah, you have one minute. Rebuttal, uh, 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 Sarah Hannah, uh, Patrick brings up your suggestions um, uh, that the government uh, take over utilities, says the cost would be astronomical. Uh, go ahead, you can respond to that. The long-term goal to have energy system under public ownership is not what we're talking about for these you know, next uh, few years. There are lots of other solutions that we should be working on, um, including one of the bills that I've been working on, which is called Bill Public Renewables Act, which would allow New York Power Authority to make its own clean energy to make for the deficit that's coming out of the private market right now, and make sure that that clean electricity is provided at 50% lower the cost to low and uh, moderate income families throughout New York. And that we're talking about a million households uh, in New York. Once again, this is an example of a bill that passed the state Senate and did not pass the assembly, but we have been making progress on it. I actually agreed that we passed a mandate, but we did not pass a plan of how to get there. And that's been my main criticism the last three years after passing the mandate, why have we not figured out, you know, pass up further legislation of how to get there. However, the rate hikes for Central Hudson is also coming from gas and gas is not a reliable, affordable source of supply. So we do have to get to cheaper renewables, uh, you know, no matter what, this is not an option that we have. Okay. Uh, all right, we're gonna move on if that's okay. Uh, 
the one, image, one, uh, one moment, please. Uh, you can, oh, go ahead. Go I ahead. think you need to clarify. The right. ultimate goal of my opponent's organization is to have public utilities owned by the state of New York, owned by the government. It does not work. It has never worked. And I, I feel that that is uh, an important distinction to make, that there, that is the ultimate goal here. Uh, we get another rebuttal. Okay, 30 seconds. 30 very seconds, very short, very short. I did not come up with this idea. FDR did back in the day. Private companies, once again, underserved rural areas of our New York, uh, you know, of our state. And FDR was the one who introduced the idea of, of uh, publicly run utilities that serve rural communities. And in fact, we still have many uh, publicly owned utilities throughout the country, and they are they have a higher record of reliability and a low and a lower record of cost uh, to its consumers. When we had the huge blackout in Texas, the one utility that survived that did not uh, overcharge its customers was the publicly owned utility in Austin, Texas. Okay, we got to move on because we only got an hour. Uh, and another topic that gets a lot of attention uh, or has been getting a lot of attention for the past couple of years uh, is uh, uh, the uh, bail reform matter uh, that was passed by uh, the New York State Legislature a couple of times. It was tweaked, uh, but it remains in effect. And some lawmakers are saying that uh, that bail reform is working fine. Uh, and then there are others who say that it should be outright repealed. Um, the uh, Patrick, I think you're going to go first on this one since Sarah Hannah went first on the last one. So go right ahead. Bail reform. Bail reform. OK, so uh, this is a, an issue that's near and dear to my heart. My thesis at Albany Law School was on the 1966 Bail Reform Act and present implications, which were in 1999 when I graduated. I worked in the Queens County District Attorney's Office. I have arraigned thousands upon thousands of people charged with crimes in the state of New York in Queens County. This bail reform that was passed in 2019 is an absolute overcorrection of a market, so to speak. Were there issues? Yes, there were. I would see things in Queens and come home to Ulster County and see completely different outcomes. I am an advocate for reform if the reform is appropriate to the needs of the community. We are seeing countless examples of how badly this, this has gone. Uh, we, have, we have to address it. The governor has punted on it. The legislature did not consult with law enforcement or with prosecutor's offices. And we have a complete disaster on our hands. And the people know it. The ridership in the subways is minuscule compared to what it was. And people are terrified that they're going to be the victims of violent crime. And we must go to Albany. We must demand changes. And I hope and pray that we will have the opportunity to do that. Uh, Sarah Hanna, uh, go ahead. It, uh, bail form is the topic. Yes, I did not hear a clear example of why the bail reform is a disaster. And with all due respect, in AD 103, I don't think we need to be concerned too much with who's riding the subway. But I do want to clarify, a lot of this has to do with cash bail. And it basically means that if somebody has committed a nonviolent felony or, or some a lot of the misdemeanors, it means they cannot be held for trial. Uh, you know, they cannot be arrested and held before trial uh, with the cash bail set. Because what happens, it, it, it ends up punishing poverty. If you're somebody who cannot afford $1,000 to get out, you're being held there sometimes for months, sometimes for years. Lawmakers agree bail reform is working fine, and so does the data. The re-arrest rate uh, has not changed. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's more or less the same since, since bail reform was introduced. The re-arrest for violent crimes is also more or less the same, especially outside of New York City. Um, and in absence of cash bail, uh, judges have the discretion of using other forms of supervision, such as anklet bracelets, for example. So the, the fear of uh, suspects skipping court also has not materialized. What we have seen, in fact, is a savings of over 600 million taxpayer dollars because people are not being unnecessarily held. And I also want to emphasize uh, that, you know, in its most current form, 
gun um, gun crimes and violent felonies are still um, cash uh, bail eligible. Um, so I think that what we should be focusing on is what created insecurity and unsafety in the last a uh, couple of years, it was not bail reform. Crime was already going up, you know, be, uh, the, because of economic insecurity. The pandemic has thrown everything, um, you know, off its anchor. And people, a lot of people, are struggling and stressed out during the pandemic. And uh, there are other places, such as in Washington D.C., where bail reform was already active without any increase in actual crime rate. And I want to point out that what has gone up is coverage of crimes rather than actual crimes. Okay, Patrick, uh, uh, go right ahead and uh, rebut. I, I would ask my opponent to speak with the family of DeGenera Mason, who was shot and killed in her home off of Broadway in 2020. This is a local issue. Yes, I am citing stuff out of New York City, but it is a, it is a statewide problem. We have increasing crime in every community. I am proud to say that I've been endorsed by the Ulster County Sheriff's PBA because they are in agreement with me as the men and women who serve this community. Having served this community, I can tell you, when you set bail, you do it because of good reasons. And when you talk to victims of crime, you have an obligation to protect and defend them. That is what I did representing the people of the state of New York. Unless you have done that, I suggest you revisit these, these statistics that you quote that are not really accurate or reflective of what's going on here. There was a recent murder at Parents Weekend at Marist College, okay? This is a major issue. We have felons walking the street unrestricted. Raise the age does not work. The HALT Act, HALT Act does not work. Thank you. Uh, Sarah Hannah, go ahead. Yep. You get uh, 30 seconds for this one. One minute. Go ahead. One these minute. Okay. These types okay. of crimes, including murders, they did not come into place after bail reform. These have been happening uh, since before bail reform was introduced. What we are lacking in is where is our investment in true safety, mental health services, counseling services, youth programs, creation of good jobs, stable homes, where is our, our support infrastructure for teachers at public schools who are dealing with teenagers who may be coming from difficult homes, who may be coming from homes where parents do not have the time uh, to spend with their family because they are working long, hard hours, possibly at multiple jobs. That is what creates true safety. And this data is data that can be looked up in terms of bail reform. Once again, I did not come up with it. It is recorded data. I think that this sort of uh, fear mongering is a distraction action from what is actually making life dangerous for us, access to safe houses, access to health care, uh, being healthy. That's what we should be focusing on. Okay, we're going to move on uh, to the next topic. Uh, another one that's uh, getting a lot of attention um, uh, across the uh, United States, uh, if not New York State, and that is the abortion <laughs> issue. Uh, the state legislature has voted once to codify abortion access in the state constitution. And by rule, they need to do it again. Uh, and then it uh, goes out for a public referendum uh, at that point. If you were in the state legislature, how would you vote on this matter? And why is that? Uh, uh, when I ask, uh, how would you vote on this matter? Meaning uh, to codify uh, it and put it in the New York State Constitution. I think Sarah Hanna gets to go first this time. Okay, go ahead. Absolutely. I would absolutely vote uh, to codify this in New York because abortion is healthcare. This has been turned into a very divisive uh, topic by folks who once again wants to stoke, you know, want to stoke fear of other people's decisions and make it, um, a, you know, people against people kind of an issue. When in fact, this is a healthcare right that affects more than fifty percent of the population. Um, these types of decisions are very important and considered for people who make it. Um, and I think that it is absolutely a basic right for someone uh, to, to have an abortion. And I think New York is going in the right direction to protect that right. Uh, I think that we cannot allow, uh, you know, uh, somebody's life 
uh, to be controlled by uh, somebody's opinion on abortion. And I think that th there's a lot we can do to make sure that we provide counseling to people who are making these decisions, uh, that we provide you know, education to younger folks uh, that could, could get stronger, could get better access to birth control, could get stronger and better. Um, and we also need to end the stigma around abortion because these are you know, life choices that people are making. They, they should not be villainized. We should not force people to make these decisions and go through this experience alone and, and guilty when so much is at stake, you know, when they've put so much weight into their decision. So I would absolutely support this. And I do not think there's a place um, in this country for, for people who are, um, you know, rallying around to uh, make abortions illegal. Okay, Patrick, what's uh, your feelings on this uh, putting abortion access in the New York State Constitution? Okay, New York has a long and storied history of supporting a woman's rights to choose. Uh, it, it, it's clear. Uh, this, this abortion issue is, is not significant to the state of New York because our laws are, in, in, some would say, extreme. Uh, whatever your position on, is on it, it is the law of the state of New York. It puts the decision in the hands of a woman and her doctor, her medical team. And, and that's rightly where it should be. Uh, if, if that were the codification that needed to be uh, afforded to the state uh, through the assembly, uh, that is something that I would support. I agree with my opponent that we must provide services, more services, and more resources and more education to young women and, and especially women at risk. Uh, it's troubling that African-American women are at the highest risk of uh, death during, uh, during birth. It, it's, uh, it's, it's not a, a statistic that I uh, take lightly. So we, we need to have uh, healthcare much more involved. I, I going back to the, uh, other topics we've discussed. We need more medical people, people who are in the field to have these conversations with us as elected officials. And, uh, and I feel that that's very appropriate. Thank you. Okay. Um, just so we're clear on this very question, the how the, the how would you vote to codify abortion in the constitution if you were elected on the next uh, session, Patrick? Would you vote to to codify it to to then bring it to the voters? I believe I just said that, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah thanks. I just want to make sure. Okay. All right. We'll go on to the next one. Patrick has has brought um, Sarah Hannah uh, <coughs> your connections up with um, American socialist uh, 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 organizations. Um, and uh, you have been uh, supported by them, including uh, one that is pretty active uh, in this area who uh, supports progressive causes and candidates for the many. Um, do you think the New York State voters uh, uh, are ready for that, are uh, ready to vote for a candidate uh, who has been endorsed by these uh, by these organizations. You can go ahead. That's for oh. me. No, yeah. that's for Sarah Hannah. We'll okay. get to you. We'll get to you, Patrick. No problem. So so I'll quickly start by saying, you know, the organization we're talking about is called Democratic Socialists of America. It is, in fact, an yes. old organization. It's been around for a while, but it was reactivated when Bernie Sanders um, ran in 2016 for presidency uh, and lost. It sort of brought new people into this idea that you could run people like Bernie Sanders. Um, and, you know, Bernie Sanders really made the idea of being socialist very accessible and non-controversial. In fact, in District 103, where we are right now, Bernie Sanders won by 60% in that presidential primary. The things that we're talking about, it's the same as FDR's Economic Bill of Rights. It's the same as you know, the, 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 the initiatives that he championed. This is why I keep bringing it back to the fact that these are not new fights. Um, I have talked to um, over 2,000 people in this district one-on-one -on -one directly knocking doors on the phone calls. Um, they do not care what the label is for socialism. We agree 
that workers who do the work should have power. We agree that people should come before profits. We agree that the private markets have failed in terms of providing basic security, whether you look at healthcare access, whether you look at um, you know, housing market, whether you look at what's happening with the climate crisis, whether you look at what's happening to our hospitals and, and, and to our schools. So people, voters should be respected for the knowledge and the opinion that they have about what's wrong with our system. You know, seniors um, who are on a fixed income, um, who might vote Republican, might vote Democrat, agree with me on many of these issues. You know, I actually have support in the general election um, from many Republicans throughout the district that I've canvassed because we agree that everyday people are really being squeezed. The average New Yorker is really being squeezed in this country. The inflation is, you know, 40% oil and gas prices and more than 50% corporate price gouging. And we really need to stand up and do something about that. Uh, Patrick, go ahead. Uh, you want to respond to that, those comments? A absolutely. Okay. These are not your grandfather and grandmother's socialist F FDR Democrat uh, initiatives. The Democrat Socialists of America want to, and I quote, uh, get rid of the undemocratic institutions like the Senate and the Electoral, Electoral College. Uh, they want a second constitutional convention uh, for a new socialist democracy. These are significant and, and seismic shifts in the kind of social programming that we as a society have done for many, many years. Uh, it goes without saying that my my candidate or my, my opponent was uh, brought here, uh, moved here in 18, uh, became a citizen here in order to run this election. Their strategic recommendations for 21 were to run local electeds, which is how they took out Dave Donaldson. And what do you know, in 2022, that strategy is run against seated incumbents at the at the state level. Uh, it, it has never worked. OK, we are getting lots of asylum seekers from South America, which the DSA talks about in their white papers at South America had a lot of social uh, organized governments. Well, all of those people seem to be getting on buses from Texas and moving to New York State now. Uh, tremendous amount of Venezuelans are coming across the border because it has not worked. It never works, and it is being brought here for that purpose, to essentially take over and hijack the process, which is what occurred in the primary race uh, against Kevin Cahill. Uh, Sarah Hannah, I'm pretty sure you want to rebut that. First of all, if you've talked to as many people as I have in this district, there are lots of grandpas and grandmas that are even to the left of me. There are a lot of them. We had strong support from folks who are over the age of 80. So I would definitely encourage going out and, and talking to people who actually live here. Second of all, I don't think as a serious candidate, you should go around saying things that are completely false and unprovable, such as I was moved here uh, to run for office. I did not even join DSA until I, it was 2020. That's and me. I- Citizen. Do you have a time you to respond? Not, not, let, let, you'll have a chance, Patrick, let Thank it go. There is, no, there is no evidence that this is what's happened. And everybody who had to convince me to run for office know that it was quite the opposite case because I am a private person. I did not want to run for office. I wanted to help other people run for office because in Kingston, I helped the campaign against Dave Donaldson because of the housing crisis and because of the corruption going on there. And guess what? The legislator in the county legislature that we elected, Phil Erner, is the one who led the initiative for the free UCAT buses that has now gone up in ridership. And people, constituents who live in his district are very happy with how accessible and available he is. You can see him walking around, biking around, talking to folks. And that is exactly the kind of local leaders that we do want. Um, and you know, as for these claims, I've heard my opponent make incredible claims like I don't live in this house. I am in this house right now, by the way. Anybody is welcome to come and visit my house. So I don't think it is a serious candidate's job to go around making these false uh, oh, personal attacks. Okay, Patrick, go ahead. My opponent is on the record that she did not join the Democrat Socialist of America Party until after she became a naturalized citizen. That is, that is clear. That's all I have to say about that. 
Okay, so we'll move on. Oh, I think I should okay. be allowed. To, and what, what, All was right, the, go ahead. What, what was the full sentence there? I said that I was afraid of being openly outspoken because of my status as an immigrant and the constant threat of being deported. Once I got married, once I settled down in Hudson Valley, I became a citizen. I decided to let go of my uh, country's citizenship because in Nepal, if you want to become, become another citizen, you have to give up your citizenship, which is the reason why I had been holding on to it. When I got married to an American, I decided my life is here now. I got citizenship. And in fact, there is okay. a Daily Freeman article from the day I got my citizenship and how emotional yep. it was that is available for the public. Yep. Okay. We got to move on. Um, as you both probably know, Patrick, uh, maybe uh, you more than anybody else being in the real estate uh, field, uh, rents are uh, skyrocketing uh, in this area. Uh, and, and in particular, uh, the county that uh, you both live in. Um, uh, there was uh, legislation uh, the, r rolling around in the New York State Legislature. It never passed, but uh, it's still uh, it's still brewing there. Called the Good Cause Eviction. Uh, Kingston uh, passed its own uh, version of that, and even established a rent guidelines board. Uh, to uh, to uh, 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 try to get control of what many believe are skyrocketing rents. Uh, and there is even been a suggestion uh, that uh, the rent control uh, uh, guidelines board or rent guidelines board uh, reduce, uh, force landlords to reduce the rents uh, of people living uh, in uh, uh, Kingston. Uh, Patrick, uh, you must be uh, pretty uh, knowledgeable about this stuff. Uh, what's your position on, 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 on that? And what do you think you can do uh, uh, if you go to uh, Albany to lower the rents? Go ahead. Okay, so this is a supply and demand issue. Uh, courtesy of COVID, thousands of people moved into the Hudson Valley. Uh, you can look at our sales tax revenues over 20 and 21. We had limited supply of rental housing prior to COVID, and every bit of it was taken up during COVID. We do have a crisis of affordable housing. That is the reason that Jim Quigley and, and the Tech City property is going to have housing built on it. That's the reason we are seeing increased affordable housing initiatives throughout the county. That is what we need to do. It is occurring. It is simply not immediate enough for those who, who demand a reduction in rents. Okay, Landlords, there are lots of good landlords out there. They're being vilified by these organizations because they're simply trying to live their own American dream in many cases. Uh, we now have a rent stabilization board here in Kingston. Rent control, some would argue, has not worked in New York City. It was put in at the end of the Second World War because of returning servicemen, and it has never, ever been overturned in New York City. And there are those who say it does not work. I'm not in agreement that we should be doing that in Kingston, especially after we've just survived COVID and in some cases, landlords not being paid for almost two years. That's my position on, on where things stand. As, as an assembly member, I would absolutely support causes of local interest to bring more affordable housing projects, but those projects also require infrastructure. And that's your job as an assembly member to make sure you can bring all of the threads together to to build what needs to be built here. Okay, Sarah Hanna, uh, same uh, same question. Are the rents uh, uh, too high, and what can uh, you do as an assembly member to try to make uh, take action on that? Go ahead. In terms of housing, the mark the private market has completely failed. We have a situation where tenants can be evicted for no other reason 
uh, than to let the lease expire and then, you know, rent it out to somebody else for a higher rent. Um, and this can keep happening. A lot of people who grew up here can no longer afford to live here because of things like that. And I agree that there are some good landlords. In fact, a few of them are volunteers in our campaign. Um, and I have spoken to many um, landlords who voted for me as well. In terms of good cause eviction, this is a bill that Assemblymember Kevin Cahill is a co-sponsor as well. What it does is give tenants the right to renew their lease unless some you know, rules have been broken or the, the landlord needs the property for their own personal use, other provable good causes. And I support this bill. It would also help um, small homeowners because what's happening is that homeowners who bought their home for a small price long time ago are struggling to deal with property taxes. When you stabilize rents, you stabilize the housing market overall, you stabilize our neighborhoods, less people coming in and out, and you also stabilize the overall property market. Now, talking about New York City, it is not just a question of demand and supply because there was a news that came out, um, I think, I believe yesterday or a day before yesterday, that rent control... Uh, a lot of rent, more than 60,000 rent stabilized apartments are being held vacant by landlord um, landlords as a form of retaliation. I also want to point out that New York City uh, real estate uh, special interests dump a lot of money into our politics and have influence over our statewide policy um, on housing. And I did see one donation of $1,000 of New York City specific real estate that donated to my opponent as well. These are the folks that we absolutely have to stand up to. Uh, we need to make sure that legislators are making laws uh, and, and not acting as, you know, part time landlords, for example, in which many cases they are, and protecting people, people because once again, if we want to be safe, stable housing, roof over your head is step number one. Okay, Patrick, uh, you want to rebut? I, I reaffirm my commitment to providing low-income solutions, uh, housing solutions, by getting the infrastructure into place in the district for those who need housing. I do believe that the vilifying of landlords who are simply dealing with post-COVID tax costs and mortgage costs and increasing costs for everything uh, is not the solution. And, and, and that is what I, I see as my opponent's uh, position. Okay, uh, we're gonna move on to another topic. Uh, uh, and another one that has been getting a lot of attention in New York State as well for the past couple of years, and that is the legalization of marijuana. Uh, the, uh, uh, it has been made legal. Uh, the state is now working on uh, policy matters uh, dealing with the setup of shops, uh, 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 dispensaries uh, across the state. Uh, and I'm wondering, uh, whether you two uh, believe that there will be any uh, societal law enforcement uh, impacts once this gets rolling, uh, where people can go to their neighborhood pot shops and uh, buy marijuana legally. Uh, Patrick, uh, you're going to go first on this one. Okay. Uh, this, this is the law of the state of New York or, or coming, coming soon to a neighborhood near you. Uh, I believe that limiting it to uh, areas away from schools, away from houses of worship and hospitals is smart. Uh, I, I am concerned for law enforcement. I'm concerned for the motoring public actually, because there are no real tests to determine if someone is under the influence of marijuana uh, in, at a certain level to, to equate to impairment. So, from an enforcement perspective, we do have a problem. Uh, there are, it's amazing to me that we have, you know, snuffed out smoking across the nation. Uh, kids don't smoke. However, they're vaping and they're, and they're ingesting marijuana products and, and no one's talking about the health dangers, particularly the mental health issues that are accompanying the use of marijuana or cannabis in young men uh, between the ages of, of 12 and 25. So my own position is that we need to limit access to areas that are appropriate, and we need some kind of enforcement mechanism to, to assist law enforcement in, in, in vetting people who are 
out in public who are potentially a harm, a danger to themselves and others. And we need more education clearly on the harm that this can do to, to young people. Okay, Sarah Hanna on the marijuana topic. Yes, I support the initiatives and the direction that the state is going, um, as well as the country in terms of marijuana. I think that this, you know, speaking of villainization, I think marijuana has affected a group, you know, informed by, by race very much often that has been unfairly uh, punished um, as a result of involvement in something to do with marijuana. Um, I personally come from a culture where use of marijuana is religious uh, and, 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 you know, uh, cultural, and I have not seen any harm uh, coming out of that. If we want to talk about comparison, um, I personally find alcohol to be uh, much more dangerous, you know, and, and marijuana, unlike alcohol, um, has a lot of medicinal purposes, has, you know, uh, calming effects on, on certain people who deal with stress and anxiety. Um, so I, I support these, um, you know, initiatives. And I think that I support um, further um, effort at undoing the harm that has been caused on a large uh, population because of marijuana use. You know, many families have been uh, torn apart and, and disrupted, especially black and brown families because of this um, severe punishment uh, related to use of marijuana. Um, so I would like to have some sort of, you know, justice um, happen there. But I, I am, um, you know, there are many people that I have encountered who are working on local initiatives for how, for example, towns like Isopis maybe, um, and other uh, places can benefit from um, marijuana being legal. Um, and I think I come to it with, you know, um, open ears and a collaborative uh, spirit. Okay, Patrick, you wanna add to any of that or? Not at all, please move No, on. okay. Um, well, this is a question for both of you. It's a, it's a common one. Um, uh, neither of you, uh, I believe, from reading your uh, web pages and, and resumes and backgrounds, have any political experience uh, at the two elective office. Uh, and um, I'm just wondering from each whether you think that's a, uh, a benefit or a hindrance, and then how come in either case. Uh, Patrick, uh, I think you're going first this time. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree. Uh, I, I'm not sure if it is a benefit or a hindrance to, to have not uh, been involved in the process up to this point. Uh, I served as an elected fire commissioner uh, for five years. Uh, it was interesting and uh, it's, it's, an, it's a burden and an opportunity. Uh, Running for this office, I have met a lot of people and having those people uh, put their faith in me to go to Albany is is humbling. Uh, I believe that as a small business owner and as someone who is from here and has an institutional uh, knowledge of the area, coupled with a law degree, uh, that will assist me in being in the assembly. Uh, that is my purpose in doing this. I, I don't really intend to do this uh, for very long. I'd like to uh, go to Albany in January and possibly go again two years out, but uh, I like business and I enjoy working in the private sector, uh, but I feel a need to, to do this right now. Okay, Sarah Hanna, go ahead. So I somewhat disagree with the premise that I don't have political experience because there are, I think, different kinds of political experiences. A lot of Albany um, is influenced by things that are happening outside, including the work that organizers are doing. You know, So somebody who's running for the fir first time for office will of course not have that experience specifically because they're doing it for the first time and that's true for everyone. But that's let's what I look, meant. Yeah. yeah, but let, you know, let's look at Michelle Hinchy. Let's look at Antonio Delgado. These, these were folks that took on these um, roles for the first time um, and it went fine, you know? Um, but I do have specific uh, experience that I want to bring to it, which is organizing. 
I have already spoken to the speaker of the assembly. I have already spoken to many people who will be my future colleagues in the assembly and started the conversation of what needs to be done um, from this district to continue Kevin Cahill's work, to build on that work and to tackle uh, crises that we have not been able to solve yet. Um, so I feel like I've already started that process. But you know, before I ran for, decided to run for office um, in, in early 2021, I was actually providing legislative uh, debriefing to legislators' offices, um, including Kevin Cahill's office, on, on this bill, Bill Public Renewables Act, you know, which is a bill that I I worked with in a group uh, that was very close to the, the writing of it and the process of moving it through the state legislature. So I, I actually do have a lot of knowledge of the legislature. What are usually the holdups? What is the process of, of writing, introducing, and moving the bill along uh, you know, different committees and, and different parts of the legislature uh, that it needs to in order to pass it? What is the kind of persistent follow-up and organizing you need to do with colleagues in order to move your priorities? Because the truth is, once again, 150 members in the state assembly, we're dealing with you know thousands of bills um, every legislative session. So once I have my priorities, I am responsible for making sure that I'm rallying support for it. And that's the experience that I have that would be very useful. Okay, Patrick, you got anything to add or? You know, I, I think this is uh, a, a little uh, over optimistic on the part of my opponent. Uh, she's worked as an organizer. I, I grant you that. Uh, I don't know what her educational background is, but having gone to college, gone to law school and worked in the private sector for my entire career, I feel that this will be a learning curve to go to Albany as an elected official. And, you know, working on campaigns and working on, on uh, initiatives is, is nice. It's good. But, uh, you know, that, that at the end of the day doesn't, uh, doesn't get the job done. And, and quite frankly, I don't even know what my opponent's background is. Uh, there's some mention of, of graphic designer uh, credentialing. Uh, you know, it, it's been fairly uh, nebulous and, and amorphous to figure that out. So perhaps she could enlighten us. Okay, Sarah Haney, you want to enlighten us? I am happy to talk in detail about my graphic design portfolio once the election is over and once we have some downtime, because it is certainly not a very important topic. I also worked in the private sector in, um, you know, in, in um, the advertisement industry, and I worked, I managed projects and worked on projects were very high profile. Um, companies. Um, and, you know, even though that's not political experience, it does come with a, lot, a strong skill set, set for dealing with people in Albany. I also wanted to mention that many of the colleagues that I mentioned who will be my future colleagues have offered to mentor me because quite frankly, all of them have said that your first year is very disorienting. Nobody tells you anything. Uh, but, you know, I have a lot of peers out there who are willing to help me. So I feel like I'm in good hands. And I also want to mention that even though I have not been elected, um, I did work on the campaign that I mentioned previously for minor tax adjustments that uh, under Governor Cuomo generated $4.3 billion. I worked on that campaign and we generated $1 billion just to assist small businesses. Okay, we're uh, we're getting to the end here, uh, uh, and we uh, uh, appreciate um, you guys coming on. Uh, that was spirited, and now we got uh, and now we got closing statements. Uh, so uh, Patrick went first uh, in the uh, in the opening statements. Now we got closing statements. Uh, Sarah Hannah, uh, you have uh, I think it's three minutes or. Two. Two. You have two minutes uh, to make a closing statement. Uh, Sarah Hannah, uh, you're up. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to be here, by the way. I, I'm, I really appreciate this opportunity to uh, debate. So I ran this campaign as a grassroots campaign. We knocked over 32,000 doors during the primary over the course of eight months. We met a lot of people um, in this district and we were not just having conversations that was, you know, will you vote for me? That's not the type of conversations we were having. We we're talking about what people are going through. And one of the biggest takeaways for me has been how welcoming 
everyone was, including people who were not supporting me, including people who were supporting my opponent. We had frank conversations. You know, there were some people who agreed with me on policy, but were still not going to vote for me. There were some people that were really, really struggling and did not, uh, no longer felt like there was a point to voting, you know? And, and I feel um, inspired by the fact that I got almost 8,000 votes because that requires a leap of faith. You know, that, that went at a time when people are being worn down by cynicism, uh, by voter fatigue, to, for people to say, let's do this and let's do this together. I felt empowered. Um, and so this district, I went into this race thinking we deserve better here, you know, knowing that Hudson Valley deserves better, that Hudson Valley can and is ready to lead. That's the slogan that we ran on. And as I met more people, I was just, um, you know, it, there was so much affirmation that that was more true than what I thought in at the beginning of the campaign when I ran. There are folks who hear what I have to say and say, I've been fighting for that for at least 30 years, whether it's renewables, uh, whether it's something generally about the economy. That's why I said there are actually a lot of grandpas and grandmas, you know, that are to, to my left. And, and that has been uh, what has been very inspiring. So since the primary, uh, we've continued to knock doors. Um, uh, we have talked to a total of over 14,000 people in this district. Um, I feel like we, we could write a paper on people who live in this district. And I feel very fortunate to have come so far. And I feel so honored uh, to, to have this opportunity. And I will absolutely you know, treasure it and take it very seriously. One thing I tell people is I do not expect to agree with everyone, not even my friends, because that's okay. not possible. But I'm here to work with everyone. OK, Sarahana, thanks very much. Uh, Patrick go ahead you have two minutes i got into this race because of the policy positions of the democrat socialists of america my opponent's website is almost a mirror image of a senate candidate in new york city named kirsten gonzalez i feel very strongly that this district needs to continue the work that kevin cahill did successfully for 13 terms i believe in representation of constituent services, of providing the money from Albany. You are one of 150 people who go there with your wheelbarrow, as I've said, and you bring money home to the district on issues of importance. That is my primary objective in going to the assembly in January. The other issues that we've discussed here today are also critical to my reason for wanting to go there. The bail reform issue must be attended to, the opioid crisis is killing our citizens. 300 people a day between the ages of 18 and 25 are dying from opioid-related deaths. I've been to two, two funerals in the last month and a half. One guy was 65, the other guy was 25. This is cutting across all ages, all socioeconomics, and all races. I believe strongly that the energy and food security issues that are coming to bear in this state due to the CLCPA are going to cause people in this district to choose between heating their homes and feeding themselves this winter. If we get a cold winter, we are going to see real problems here. And I plan to go to Albany to request more assistance for HEAP and WIC so that we can avoid tragedies this coming winter. That's why I'm here and that's why I've done this. Thank you very much for your help. And I hope you can all, everyone can come out on November 8th, whether you vote for me or my opponent. Everybody needs to vote. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're good here. Uh, again, uh, Freeman, thanks you, you guys, Sarah Hannah and Patrick for coming in and uh, election day is uh, November 8th. Uh, and uh, we uh, hope to be bringing you uh, more of these debates uh, in the near future. Early election starts on, on October 29th. Early election out. starts on uh, October 29th. That's a Saturday. Okay, very good. Thanks, you guys, for coming in. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. All right.